We are live. Coming to you live. It's been live. Say what's up to the people, Dad. Hey, good to have you aboard. As Roseanne Rosanna Dana used to say, the late great comedian, there's always something. We always have plenty to talk about. And I'm happy to take your questions, but don't forget those memberships and donations that keeps us alive. I want to give some shout outs to some people in the chat. Isaac Newtall, Eric Jones, member Barry Smith, member Shelley Winters, Jay Couch, member Terry Green, the Alex Treefire, Eric Jones, member Sean Matthew, Patrick Murray. A lot of good people here in the chat. Jamie Smith, Will yeah, Strumiker. We got President Belichick in the chat. Is he a, is he a member? He claims he always claims he is, but he never shows up as a member. So I don't know what's going on. All right. On tell him to get on the ball and join. Hello, Quinn. Hello, I Heart New York. Susan Clark, Owen Valdada, member Captain Murray, and member Jason Lombada. Okay. Let's get right into it, Dad. Um, what are we talking about today? We've got a couple topics. We've got the jurors selected in the Trump trial, we've got Ukraine aid and the infighting again over the speakership in the House. Where do you want to start? Let's start with Ukraine aid and the circus in the house. It appears, you know, quite surprisingly, but I've got to give him a lot of credit for this, that Speaker Mike Johnson, you know, who I've criticized before for being very, very extreme to the right, you know, anti-abortion, uh, anti rights for transgender gays and and lesbian people. Uh, But he seems to be doing the right thing, and that is pushing through aid to Israel and most controversially for his own caucus, aid to Ukraine. When I say doing the right thing, I'm not just speculating. We now have, just came out a couple of days ago, a Russian intelligence memo uh, that was intercepted by the CIA, supposedly a secret document, which talks about Russia's goal, which you know you and I have been talking about forever, to destabilize the West, to destabilize the United States, and to restore the old Soviet empire in Europe, which would be greatly to the peril of the US. I'll just read you a few quotes from, this is directly from the Soviet memo. It calls for, quote, an offensive information campaign that includes measures such as the military, political, economic, and trade, and informational psychological spheres of warfare against a coalition of unfriendly countries led by, who do you think, Sam? Vladimir Putin, Russia. Led by the United States, Russia's unfriendly list of unfriendly countries. Led oh, by the, I see. the opposite. Right. Okay. I'm reading from the Russian memo here. Oops. Pay attention or I'll give you a C. Oh, no. Yeah, I'll put it on your permanent record. Ah. Goes on to say it's important to create a mechanism for finding the vulnerable points of their, meaning the West, external and internal policies which have their aim of weak which with the aim of developing practical steps to weaken Russia's opponents remember who are led by the United States the outcome of Russia's war in Ukraine will to a great degree determine the outlines of Russia's future world order. Could Bosco be any clearer, Sam? No. What are they trying to do? F shit up. Exactly. And Ukraine is pivotal in all of this. That's the vulnerable point. That's the pivot point that they are stressing. Because they believe if they win in Ukraine, and things are getting pretty desperate with Republicans having held up aid to Ukraine for months, but the Russians believe, Putin believes, if they win in Ukraine, it might not end the NATO alliance, but it will so splinter and weaken the NATO alliance 
that Putin and his allies like Orban in Russia and dictators in Belarus will become the dominant force in Europe once again, something we haven't seen since the days of the Soviet Union. So aid to Ukraine is not only essential to helping the you know, utterly outnumbered, utterly embattled people who are literally the victims of war crimes and genocide on the part of Putin's Russians, but it is absolutely central to the national interests of the United States. You know, I don't know what people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates and Chip Roy are thinking. You know, we talked about this before. You don't think they're actually playing Putin's game consciously but you think they just believe this America first approach works for them politically, and they don't care one way or another in terms of uh, how it might advance the Putin agenda. Well, we've seen this movie before. When was the last time we saw a big America first movement that resisted aid to aid to nations fighting dictators? 1930s. Exactly. The America first movement of the 1930s and what big celebrity, Sam, was their spokesperson? Uh, America's hero. He was a pilot, right? Yes. You Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh. And Lindbergh said, you know, he injected anti-Semitism, racism, saying our bond with Europe is a bond of race. And this battle between Germany and England, it's not like we're resisting some, you know, non-white, peoples. It's just an internal battle within the white, white race, and we have no business getting in, involved. And he said, who's pushing us into war? Who do you think he blamed for pushing America into war? Guess who? Uh, FDR. Same people that get blamed for everything. FDR? No, no, the whole, a whole people. Who gets always oh, gets Jews, blamed? Jews. The Jews, of course. It's the Jews, you know, who are like, you know, three, two, three percent of the country somehow manipulating America into war. Well, if they had their way, Hitler would have conquered the Soviet Union and they wouldn't have cared. Three million Jews in the Soviet Union or four million. What would have happened to them if Hitler conquered the Soviet Union? Big trouble. It would have killed them all. Many millions of more Jews would have died. They also likely would have conquered England and controlled the entire continent of Europe. Forget Lindbergh for a moment. Look at the leading Republican in Congress in the late 1930s, son of a president. You know who that was? Of course. Um, Senator Robert Taft, Taft, Taft one of uh, William Howard Taft, who said, yeah, I'd prefer Britain to win, but I don't really care. We could perfectly well live with a Europe dominated by the Nazis. What incredible naivete. Do you think after conquering the continent of Europe, Hitler would just, oh, I'm done. You know, I was a dictator for a while, but I'm, I'm gonna stop now. And, you know, I don't care what's going on in South America or the United States, nonsense. Done everything in his power to undermine America, take over Latin America, and ultimately try to take over the United States. That's just how disastrous the America First policy was back then, and now we see it being repeated. Can I play devil's advocate for a second? Go right ahead. The, those examples you provided are very good, but right? That was in 1945. Since then, we've had the Cold War, the war in Vietnam, and maybe similar rhetoric was used to pull us into those conflicts. Now, obviously, hindsight is 2020. It's very easy to say that our involvement in World War II was a good choice and our involvement in Vietnam was probably a bad choice. But how do you differentiate the two and how do you separate or compare Ukraine to the two? Yeah. It's a very good point. This was not 1945, by the way. This was 1939 and 1940, but that's okay. There's a fundamental difference here. We are not going to war in Ukraine like we did in Vietnam or we did in Iraq, two wars that you know, I think, were very big mistakes. We are helping the Ukrainian people defend themselves, just as until Pearl Harbor, 
forced us into World War II. We were not sending troops off to Europe to fight. We were providing the essential supplies for the Allies to resist Hitler. So the Ukraine aid is more similar to the Lend-Lease program that saved Britain and the Soviet Union from being conquered by Hitler than it was to the war in Vietnam and the war in Iraq. But you're absolutely right. We got to, you know, got to be very careful not to fall into the trap of presuming there are military solutions to non-military issues. We knew, you know, those of us who were around then, so many of us understood that there wasn't a military solution to the end. Eisenhower said it back in the 50s when he resisted sending troops to Vietnam. You know, he said, this is a political problem, not a military problem. Same thing with Iraq. You know, the issue with Iraq was the three different groups fighting against one another. But this is really different. You know, we are helping a free people save themselves against another murderous dictator intent upon world conquest. Uh, what do you want to talk about next? The Trump trial? Let's talk about a little bit about the trial, and then we'll open it up to our questions. So uh, what surprises me about the trial so far is they've already seat seated the jury. You know, they were talking about two weeks to seat the jury and the alternates. It looks like it's going to take one week. They've already seated the 12 jurors. I think they need six alternates. They already have one. So the chances are by tomorrow, Friday or Monday at the latest, they're going to have 12 jurors and six alternates, which is a pretty amazing thing. The other thing that doesn't surprise me, but is absolutely reprehensible, but is absolutely consistent with everything we know about Donald Trump and his allies is jury intimidation. You know, Donald Trump retweets something that was posted on Fox News about, you know, liberal activists lying to get on the jury. Of course, no substantiation. And, you know, it's typical Trump. He tries to leave himself a back door out. Well, I didn't say this. I just retweeted what someone else said. That's not an excuse. When you retweet, we retweet something. Say that four times fast. Uh, you're retweet giving it. Retweet your something. Imprimatur. Retweet something. Retweet something. All right, wise guy. Uh, you're giving it your imprimatur. You're endorsing it. And Fox News has been absolutely reprehensible, not only generally attacking the jury, but attacking individual jurors to the extent that one juror, juror number two, had to withdraw because of what was exposed about her. Another judge is ha having a hearing, I think next Tuesday, about possible sanctions. You know, Trump himself now, according to prosecutors, has violated the gag order 11 times. And this is serious. You know, people who have been the targets of Donald Trump's attacks have been the subject of death threats, anti-Semitic, uh, racist uh, attacks. Two women from... Uh, Georgia, who were election workers, had to leave their home and go into hiding. Someone in New York just pleaded guilty for sending death threats to Judge Ngoran, you know, the judge who presided over the New York City fraud civil trial. This is serious stuff. And, you know, this is jura intimidation. Anyone else had done that, they would have already been held in contempt and put in jail. But this judge, for a lot of good reasons, is very reluctant to do that with Trump. But they're talking about $1,000 fines for each violation. Is a $1,000 fine going to stop Donald Trump? That's all they charged him? They haven't decided yet. They have a hearing. But what they've been talking about, and whether that holds in the hearing next Tuesday, is a $1,000 fine for each violation. That would be like fi 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 fining you two cents, Sam. I could afford that. Yeah, and I think Trump can afford $1,000. You know, we haven't talked about this much, but Trump has pulled off the ultimate scam of his scam fold career, and that is this truth social stock a worthless company right yeah 
worse than worthless, a money losing company. And, you know, Trump creates this, you know, public offering. Billions of dollars go into it. The stock has collapsed, but it's still worth some billions of dollars. Trump has the majority of the shares and can dump them in six months at whatever they're worth. And how much of his own money did he put into this? I don't know. None, I guess. Take a guess. None. This is Trump. Zero, not a naught, negative, nugatory, none. So he's taking no risk. All those great MAGA followers who put their money into this because it was Donald Trump endorsing it are going to lose their shirts. And once again, Trump is going to walk away with his pockets full and everyone else will take the loss. It's just, you know, the greatest scam ever. You take no risk. You do nothing, and no matter what happens, the only question is whether you make millions or billions. Speaking of Trump, um, I wanted to talk about this surveillance FISA bill. It's it, I was hearing a little bit about it. It seemed odd. Did you did you follow that? It seemed like it was dead, and then suddenly it was dead. Right, and it and seems like another bill that is going to give the government more authority to spy on America's citizens, which is... It's not more. It's a renewal, as I understand it, of the FISA uh, existing... Well, that's... Authority. My point is that's incredibly unpopular, and it seemed to now pass. You know, it, it's, it's one of those issues that's very, very difficult because it's all conducted in secret. We don't know what the FISA court does, but the original idea of the FISA court was to give some legal uh, guide rails on surveillance. So you wouldn't just be surveilling Americans without judicial supervision. So the idea behind FISA is actually to guard against overzealous sur surveillance, like the kind of things that uh, the CIA was found to be doing for so many decades. Now you've got to go to the court you got to give them a reason and you got to get a warrant from the court. Now, how that's been abused or not, since it's secret, it's very hard to know. Um, any updates on Iran and Israel? I heard last I heard that Israel said that they they won't consider this over, right? That's the last I've heard too, but I find it pretty remarkable that they waited this long. I hope they do consider it over. You know, I understand, you know, Israel policy is we never let an attack on our soil stand. You know, there are all these enemies who are committed to destroying Israel and the Jewish people utterly, and we just can't let any attack stand. I get that, and I understand that. Nonetheless, as I think Biden said, or someone in the Biden administration, take the win. You've utterly humiliated Iran. They look like the most, you know, phony big power there ever was. And you've turned around world opinion. You know, Iran did for you what you could never have done for yourself, deflected attention away from the devastation in Gaza. And, you know, maybe not moved world opinion in your favor, but certainly had, you know, a positive impact for you on world opinion. So take the win and don't do anything more because nobody but nobody benefits from a wider war in the Middle East. Not Israel, not Iran, not the US, not anyone anywhere in the world, except Hamas and Hezbollah and those uh, you know, terrorist forces that thrive on chaos. Let's get to some questions. How do you feel about that, sir? You know, I'm always ready for questions. We got some great ones last time, I expect. No less, but if you become a member, which we're really hoping, you know, it's less than a cost of a sandwich per month, well less, uh, you get preference for questions, although we take questions from everyone. Well, no, we take, we prioritize questions from members and donations. Right. Um, but you're not precluded from asking a question. No, you can if still. If you're a member or donate, but you get preference. Well, it's, I'm, I'll be frank. I'm not going to get to your question if you're not a member. We get too many questions now. It's just not even possible. But 
you are free to watch, interact with the channel. That's all free, obviously. But look, you know, we're not a charity. We got to make some money doing this to, for our time. Um, yeah, if we don't, we'll be we'll be off the air. And again, I take not a penny from this. So this just goes to keeping us on the air. Um, Barry Smith asks, why is Biden ha- why is Biden having a problem with the ballot in Ohio, and how can it be best resolved? Yeah, I mean, this is a total scam on the part of Republicans in Ohio. They're saying that uh, the Democratic convention is being held too late to meet the requirements to get on the Ohio ballot. It's total nonsense. Of course, you can get on the Ohio ballot in the summer, you know, long before the election or even early voting. And they made exceptions before for Republicans. So it's a total scam from this you know, terrible Ohio legislature, which has gerrymandered the state, ignored rulings even from the Supreme Court, and is now trying to keep Biden off the ballot in Ohio. It's it's an outrage, an absolute outrage. Thank you, Jay949, for the dollar donation. Thank you, President Belichick, for your donation, and Alex Treefire. Oh. Ah. Um. Jack Tioli asks, what impact do you think the Kennedy family endorsement could have on the third party key? It's a good question. Uh, for those of you who aren't following it, uh, pretty much en masse, the Kennedy family came out and endorsed Biden and in effect rejected the candidacy of their sibling or their cousin, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. included, you know, quite a few of his siblings, including my good friend here in Maryland, uh, Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, former lieutenant governor. Everybody's your good friend. Everybody's your good friend. Why not? I'm a good guy. People like me. Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, who knows what kind of effect it'll have. It's not necessarily going to pump up the vote for Biden much, but the idea really is to take the shine off the uh, RFK Jr. candidacy to show he does not represent the Kennedy family. He is he is not the heir to the legacy of John or Robert Kennedy. And I think that's absolutely right. Chris Wall says, two questions. Would you be interested in writing a book applying the keys to pre-1860 presidential elections? And second Short question, answer to that one, no. And this, <laughs> We've talked about that yeah. a lot before. It gets, you know, the system is different early on. The data is very tricky to nail down. So I really don't see a point in trying to shoehorn the keys into pre-1860, but you can try. You can write the book. The keys are, you know, they're open source. Anyone can use them. Their second question is, are you ready to call the long-term economy key? I'm not calling any further keys probably until July or early August. Hamlet asks, what do you think of the void de... How do you say this? Voyeur Deary process so far. So far, are the lawyers? Well, the Wadir process. Yeah. yeah, I actually think it's been pretty good. Uh, look, you know, I'm I'm not in the courtroom, so I'm only, and there's no cameras in the courtroom, which is a tragedy. Absolutely, this trial should be televised. This trial is of immense public interest. Probably the greatest trial for public interest in the history of the country, at least since the trial of for treason of former Vice President Aaron Burr back in the early 19th century. And, you know, this notion, oh, if it's televised, it becomes a circuit. That's nonsense. This judge is in charge. He controls his courtroom. Just because there's a blinking eye in the back would not change anything. You know, I I watched a lot of the Murtaugh trial. I watched a lot of the uh, Chauvin trial, the, the policeman convicted of murdering George Floyd. They weren't circuses. They were no different from any other trial that didn't have cameras. So it's absolutely a crime. <laughs> no one's going to be charged, of course. A crime. But they don't have cameras <laughs> in, in the courtroom here. So, you know, I'm only getting it second and third hand, but they do seem to have found a jury rather quickly. And uh, 
I have no comment on it, so I don't know anything about the jury, but those who commented on it seem to think it, it's a reasonable enough jury. You're never going to get a perfect jury for either side. I don't care what kind of case it is. Each side is going to have their gripes, but I didn't get the impression that there is someone on this jury who is, you know, so much in the bag for Donald Trump that no matter what the evidence, they would never vote to convict. Now, who knows? But certainly overtly, there doesn't seem to be that kind of presence on the jury, nor does there seem to be that kind of presence on the jury of those who would convict no matter what, even if the evidence didn't prove the crime. Isaac Nuttall asks, Democrats seem historically unenthusiastic about Biden, i.e. Gaza and student debt. Historically, has an incumbent ever won with this level of apathy? Sure. You know, in, in, incumbents often, you know, people are dissatisfied with incumbents. There was a lot of grousing about Barack Obama in 2012 you know, particularly after the disastrous midterm elections of 2010, when Republicans gained over 60 seats, you know, a modern record in the U.S. House. And Obama went on to win an easy victory over Mitt Romney, despite a lot of the pundits and the pollsters predicting a Romney win. So you can't predict you know, election outcomes from any one factor like that. J949 asked, did we ever get a real final vote count in Florida in 2000 post-Supreme Court rulings? Absolutely not. Uh, as I've said many times, the wrong person was elected president in 2000. Based on the intent of the voters, Al Gore won Florida going away. The problem was that the suppression, not the suppression, but the throwing out of black voters, two different things. One is to stop black voters from voting, and that happened probably more than enough to turn the election. But worse yet was the tossing out of ballots cast by African-Americans who thought they had legitimately voted. I proved this in my report to the United States Commission on Civil Rights. It's still on their website, you can check it out, or my article in the Journal of Legal Studies in 2003, you can check that out as well. And my findings have been confirmed by subsequent political scientists who've looked at it. One out of every nine to 10 ballots cast in Florida in 2000 by African-Americans were tossed out. So if you lined up 10 African-Americans, all of whom thought they voted, and virtually all of them voted for Gore, you would pluck out one and say, sorry, your vote didn't count. That compared to one out of 50, one out of 50 uh, discarded ballots cast by whites. If ballot rejection for black voters was not zero, but just the same as for white voters, so there was no disparity, Gore would have won by over 40,000 votes. Patrick Murray says, what effect can the Niger military conflict have on the foreign military failure key if things escalate? Well, you never know. You know, so far, I don't think it's penetrated the public consciousness very, very much. But uh, it's, it, 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 you know, probably not one out of 50 Americans know anything about it. But you're right, it, it, it's something to monitor and something to look at. But to this point, it hasn't turned a key. Ian Matharu says, Maine this week became the 18th state to join National Popular Vote Interstate Compact with its four electoral votes. The total is now 209, 61 to go. Michigan, 15 electoral votes could be next. It could happen, do you think, Professor? I sure hope it happens. I think the Electoral College is one of the great stains on American democracy. Look, you know, we are the world's longest running democracy, democratic republic, if you want to put it, however, uh, well over 200 years. And that's a great thing because democratic traditions are deeply imbued in our society, although they're being strained to their limit right now, but I'm not going to get into that. That's another topic. On the other hand, we are stuck 
with some 18th century institutions, the worst of which is the Electoral College. A main reason for the Electoral College was slavery. You know, a million slaves in the South. If you had a popular vote, Sam, for president, how many votes would the slaves account for? How many votes would the slaves cast? Simple answer to that. Zero. They couldn't vote. But if you have an electoral college. Sorry, I, I was a deer in the headlights there. Which is apportioned by congressional seats and Senate seats. If you count slaves for apportionment, then in fact your slave population pumps up your electoral college vote. Now the North wasn't quite going to go for that. But the result was a notorious compromise. Do you know what that notorious compromise was about slaves? Three-fifths rule? Three-fifths compromise, right. Slaves would count for three-fifths of a person for apportionment of congressional seats and also the Electoral College. So that was the compromise, Electoral College. There were other reasons for it, but it was directly tied to slavery. And it wasn't as bad back then in terms of... Uh, overstating small states and understating large states and population. The difference was only about six to one. Now it's almost 70 to one. So, you know, California should have 10 more electoral college votes, which would have a massive effect on elections. And states like Alaska and Montana should have two less. But the pro and you, if you take, you know, uh, surveys show that the great majority of Americans would like to go to popular vote. Can't amend the Constitution. So you have this compact that states agree that uh, they would go along with the popular vote. The problem is, so far, they're all blue states. Every state in the compact voted for Biden in 2020. If you got states like Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Arizona, swing states, it would mean everything. Def Leopard Rules Rock asks, do you think Florida can flip blue in November after the state Supreme Court ruling on abortion rights? Well, if you had told me before the state Supreme Court, you know, authorized the six-week abortion ban, which is in effect a total abortion ban, right? Most women don't even know they're pregnant within six weeks. It's absolutely draconian. Uh, you know, the party that's supposedly the party of personal liberty is cracking down in unprecedented ways in the liberties of Americans. It's very tough go in Florida. You know, Florida's been trending red, not blue or purple. So while, you know, I would never say never, I think it's going to be tough for Biden to win Florida, although this ruling does at least open the door a crack, which a door that I thought was closed before that. Cuba Bella 5 says, your thought about rumors that Democrats will hold their convention at the end of August because they may decide to replace Biden with Michelle Obama. <laughs> uh, I think there were two chances of that, Sam. Slim. None. none. <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jose Marquez, for the $2 donation. Captain M90 says, do you think Trump's grip on the RNC might cause the Dems to win midterm mandate because he will drain the support to down-ballot Republicans? They've already lost midterm mandates based on the last midterm election, 2022. It can't be based on 2026 since that election has taken place yet. But your point is well taken. You know, Republicans may well have hurt themselves for the next midterm election, which will have an effect on the mandate key one way or another for 2028. Rye asks, for 2024, what would make the no foreign slash military failure key true versus false? And what would make the military success true versus false for Biden? What kinds of questions don't I answer? He doesn't Sam? deal in hypotheticals, people. Next. Exactly. If I answer that, people are going to jump on it and say, I see Lickman, you know, said the key is turning this way or that. I, I don't want to dodge your question, though. Well, dodge I can it. tell you. Just dodge it. Who cares? Nah, I'll, I'll like three quarters dodge it. I'll, you know, get a little bit sideswiped. You know, and it's nothing I haven't said before. 
it basically is going to depend on what happens in the Middle East and what happens in Ukraine. If, in fact, you know, six months or say even four, three or four months from now, Russians have made major gains in Ukraine, things are still disastrous in Gaza, that would not be good for Biden. On the other hand, if, you know, we get the aid into Ukraine and they start making gains and, you know, there's some Biden works out a ceasefire and gets hostages released. That'd be good for Biden. But the devil is always in the details, which is why I don't answer hypotheticals. But I've given you something to think about anyway. Um, Tulak Horde and the Occult Orchestra Gen Sec ass. That's their full name. And I'm not going to pronounce that. Yeah, they say U.S. people are sick of being the superpower of the world and its obligations. Can you really blame people who want to focus on our problems first? I don't, actually. I think, you know, that's very appealing, just as it was appealing to people in 1940. Hitler's not our problem. You don't have to worry about him. Yeah, he might, you know, conquer Europe, might kill a few million Jews, but we got the Atlantic Ocean, you know, we're okay. I understand that. The problem is it doesn't work. If World War II, Pearl Harbor, 9-11 taught us anything, we cannot simply say, let's just turn inward, worry about us, and forget about the world. The world has a way of catching your attention, no matter how far your head is in the sand. Especially if you're America. Like, it might be easy for the Czech Republic to do that, right? Or It's not so easy, because they're right next to Russia. Right. Well, I'm just <laughs> saying, when you are have the scale and the power of America, of it's course. hard to just turn your back. You know, it's you can't really hide when you're that big. We're also, you know, the leader of the global economy. It's not as if, you know, we can just shut off the world and, you know, just turn inward strategically, politically, and economically. It's not even possible, even if we wanted to. But you're certainly right, you know, about the stature of the United States and how inevitable our involvement in the world is. Artem asks, how realistic do you think Hungary's exit from the European Union is? Uh, it's probably beyond my expertise. I'm not an expert in internal European politics, but if I were to guess 50-50. 50-50? 50-50. Fifty-fifty. So don't bet on it one way or the other. Right. Find something else to bet on. You know, we have the NBA playoffs. You can bet on that. The NHL playoffs, bet on that. Is abortion a strategically effective issue for Biden to leverage in order to secure victory? And does it influence the major policy change key? He's already won the major policy change key. And abortion has nothing to do with that because it's not as if Biden has instituted some new abortion policy. Now, it could influence other keys, though. So I think it is something to be emphasized. In particular, the key it could influence is the third party key. You know, if it gets more enthusiasm for Biden and less for RFK Jr., that's a good thing for Biden. Where I think it will have a major impact, though, is every other election, whether it's Senate, Congress, state legislature, uh, particularly in states where an abortion referendum is on the ballot. And it looks like that'll be the case in Arizona and Florida, I think. Uh, it's going to have a major impact on every down ballot election. We have 300 people watching, Dad, but only 89 likes. So please give us a like. If you're not subscribed, please subscribe and become a member today because um, members get priority on questions. Our member, Riley P., asks, do you think Trump will pull out of the debates this year? Probably. I'd be pretty surprised if there are going to be debates. Uh, Trump did very poorly in the debates against Hillary Clinton. Uh, didn't do him any good. Again, I don't think debates affect the keys, but I'd be really surprised. You know, Trump will bluster a lot, just like, I'm going to testify in this case. I'd be shocked if he actually testifies in his election fraud New York City case. And, you know, he'll bluster, I want a debate, I want 50 debates, you know, 
but in the end, he'll probably put up enough roadblocks and you know conditions that the debates uh, don't take place. Our good friend Jim Blowers with a ten dollar donation. Thank you, Jim. They ask, does the Iran failure give key eleven to Biden? No, by itself, uh, that's not sufficient because uh, it certainly helps. But that whole situation between Israel and Iran is far from being played out. It's far from over, and. Uh, this is a tactical win, but it's not a strategic win yet. James LaGruta says, why are Republicans now prioritizing anti-Semitism on college campuses, considering Marjorie Taylor Greene's space lager comment and Trump's comments after Charlottesville? Exactly. You know, the MAGA movement has owned anti-Semitism. Yes, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene's the one who says, Jewish masterminds are shooting space lasers at the United States, kind of recreating, in modern terms, the worst anti-Semitic means. And Trump, you know, talks about fine people, some very fine people among the neo-Nazis chanting Jews will not replace us. But that's not the worst. The worst is what they've done with George Soros. Just as back in the 30s, the far right wing, the right wing, made Felix Frankfurter, FDR's Jewish advisor, the mastermind of an evil Jewish plot against America. Now they've made the Jewish Holocaust survivor, George Soros, the target of a supposed evil Jewish plot against America, and worse, tied it to racism, that George Soros is paying off black people to attack Trump and to create violence and mayhem in the United States. You know, Trump and his allies have called Bragg bought and sold by Soros. Republican ads, particularly in the South, have said George Soros play pays black people to kill whites. George Soros pays black people to riot. Climate change didn't work, so let's start the race war. This is actual quotes from Republican ads tying together racism and anti-Semitism. Now, all of a sudden, they're so worried about anti-Semitism on campus. It's hypocrisy thick enough to cut with a spoon. It's pure political opportunism because they want to discredit these so-called woke, you know, left-wing universities. Can I say something about it? Yes. I agree that it does feel disingenuous, especially because they often are these, you know, absolute, a lot of these right wing, ah, a lot of these right wingers are these absolutists when it comes to free speech, right? Except when it seems to come to this Israel Palestine conflict, which is, I think, disingenuous. On the other side of the coin, I, I sort of appreciate it because I do think they are, whether it's coming from the right source or not. They are calling out a lot of these universities on their BS because it seems on some issues they race to say we're protecting these people no matter what, even if it infringes on some people's free speech. When it comes to Israel and Palestine and anti-Semitism, they seem to be rushing to the other corner and be maintaining their we're beacons of free speech. And I actually kind of appreciate them calling out college campuses because I because because I think college campuses haven't been con consistent they use you're to absolutely right i don't disagree with that uh but you know what goes on in college campuses absolutely deserves to be scrutinized and you know these college administrators have a very fine line to walk and i've said before you've heard me say this i thought they did a terrible job in responding to questions in congressional hearings you heard me say you know, these are college presidents. They should know how to deal with politicians and how to deal with the press and how to answer questions properly. And their performance was just abysmal and shocking. And you, what I think needs to be done is, and I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is, where you draw the line between free speech and speech that is so unacceptable that it goes over the line 
of free speech, a very, very difficult issue. I usually come down on, on the side of free speech, but I'm not a college administrator. I don't actually have to make these policies. But again, anything that's going on on college campuses pales in comparison to the way in which Trump and his allies have exploited anti-Semitism over the last decade. Thank you, Nathan Zadro, for becoming a member. Um, nice. Itchies asks, have you ever heard of the YouTube channels Legal Eagle and Let's Talk Elections? You should collaborate. Have you ever heard of them, Dad? Nope. Have you? Yes. You're the, I, maven. Yes. You're the media maven. <laughs> yes, I've heard of both of them. If you want us to collaborate, get on their channels, You know, get on their lives, tell them to uh, have Alan on and collaborate with us because – my cold emails don't seem to do anything. You know, I've reached out to some YouTube channels and, you know, just not, absolutely nothing back. So um, along those lines, let me say I've just been contacted by CNN. They want me on Newsnight, which starts at 10 p.m. on next Thursday. Is next Thursday the 25th? Um, let me check. Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to be on Newsnight sometime after 10. So we may have to slightly jigger our time for next week. If Sam can do it, maybe come on a little bit earlier. Wow, you're choosing CNN over us. Thanks a lot, Dad. I would never choose CNN over you. But I think the audience may be a little larger. Maybe. And everyone in our audience can watch me on CNN. True. You should also plug the show when you're on. You should say, I have my own YouTube channel where I go Absolutely. live. You know, I did a big lecture today to the JP Morgan Investment Group, which is in charge of $3.7 trillion. And I forgot to plug the show. I'm oh. not I'm I know. What a disaster. <laughs> You made me walk off. You're giving up on me? You made me walk off. That's why it was such a disaster as a political candidate. I'm really bad at self-promotion. Right. <laughs> Andrew asked, do you think Trump's conviction may be such a strong factor it'll outweigh your keys? It's possible. I've talked about this before. You know, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm not one of these, you know, Christian conservatives who thinks God speaks to them. Keys are based on history. Very robust history goes back to 1860, retrospectively, and forward to 1984. But it's always possible some event can be so cataclysmic outside of experience that it could influence elections outside the context of the keys. And it's it's possible that a Trump conviction for a serious felony, you know, everyone says no. Former president has ever been on criminal trial before. That's only a half truth. That misses the other part of it, which is no major party candidate, whether sitting president or not, has ever been on trial for crime. So we are dealing with something unprecedented that could conceivably, outside the context of the keys, have an import, or it could affect a key. That's always possible as well. Derek Taylor, our good friend, asks, if I can ask, how many public interviews do you have per week or month about your prediction system? I have no idea. A lot. <laughs> A um, lot. Alexander. In election year, probably three or four a week. Alexander Ella with their first super chat. Thank you, Alexander. They say, the U.S. is trying to broker a deal between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Israel would commit to a Palestinian state and Saudi Arabia would recognize Israel. Could this turn the foreign policy success key? Again, you know, I don't answer hypotheticals. Depends on the details, but it certainly would have that potential. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think Israel is under Netanyahu, who I've been very critical of, as you know. Uh, I don't think Netanyahu is ready to accept a Palestinian state. What a dumbass. Um, Jacob Venner says, Hi, Alan. You said you changed the keys in 2000 to account for the Electoral College rather than the popular vote. How did you change it? I didn't change the keys. The keys are the same. I simply now predict the winner. 
and don't bother with the popular vote because predicting the popular vote is useless. You know, I know you know the answer to this, Sam. Since 1992, how many times have Republicans won the popular vote? Once. Once, 2004, and barely. So because the Democrats rack up five to six million extra votes in New York and California, which count for nothing in the Electoral College, I don't bother with the popular vote anymore. Member Pro Viewer says, do you think Barry Goldwater opposed the Civil Rights Act because he genuinely believed in states' rights or purely for political gain? Oh, my God. You're asking me to crawl into the head of the long dead (laughs) Barry Goldwater. I think it's a little bit of both. I actually, you know, though I disagreed with him, I was actually around then, believe it or not. What? Uh, Yeah, believe it or not. (laughs) But not for Lincoln, so we're okay. Um, Nathan, Um, oh, you didn't answer the question. (laughs) I'm, I'm in the middle. So, you know, although I disagreed with Goldwater about everything, you know, I, I do think he was very forthright in, in, in setting forth Republican principles and did influence the next two generations of Republicans. I'm not sure I answered the question. What exactly did the question I want? Do you think that his Barry Goldwater's opposition to the Civil Rights Acts was because huh. he generally yeah. believed in states' rights or purely for political gain. Yeah, I think it's, he probably did it mostly for political gain. He actually, when he was in Arizona, was kind of known as a civil rights supporter, and then that goes down the drain once he becomes a national candidate. So I do think a lot of it had to do with political gain. I can't say he didn't believe in states' rights, can't prove a negative, but I think a lot of it had to do with political gain because the object, a big object of his campaign was to try to win over the Democratic South for the Republican Party. He became infamous for saying, "We, if you want to go duck hunting, you've got to go where the ducks are. That is, where are the new Republican ducks among the white supremacist, still Jim Crow South. Quack, quack, mother effer. Am I right? But you're right. Um, Nathan Zadro says, good day, Lichtmans. I know this might sound naive, but where did Biden's opponents come up with the genocide Joe moniker? Is there any truth to it? Of course, there's no truth to it whatsoever. It just cheapens, you know, the whole concept of genocide. You know, Vladimir Putin, who they're appeasing, he's committing genocide. I don't know where they think Joe Biden is committing genocide. Just another one of those slogans designed to smear Biden. You know, Biden certainly isn't the most, not the most exciting, the most inspirational, you know, candidate you can find. He's very vanilla. But the fact that he's very vanilla means all these extreme attacks on Biden have no basis whatsoever. Shelly Winters says, um, oh, no, that was a, no, yes. Shelly Winters asks, what do you think of the Polish president visiting Trump? It disturbs me. You know, I think a lot of Europe and, you know, I've talked to people, you know, I've keynoted a number of financial conferences and I've talked to people of a lot of European contacts and they think that a lot of Europeans believe Trump is going to win. And so they've kind of kind of, you know, reconciled themselves to that and to some extent cozy up to them. The problem is even more than people in America, because they don't have much else to go on, they're listening to the pollsters and the pundits who we know are wrong at least half the time. Kana Katara says, what were you doing on 9-11? And do you think it would have happened if Gore were president? I'm not going to answer the hypothetical, but I will tell you what I was doing. Believe it or not, on 9-11, I was on Fox News. I used to do a lot of Fox News when Fox News was, you know, pretty impartial. Uh, I don't know if you know where Fox News is in D.C. It's right next to the U.S. Capitol. So we're watching the attack on the World Trade Center 
on television. I swear, at first I thought it was a movie or a cartoon. It didn't look real, you know, to see it happening in real time. You couldn't even believe it was happening. But no one knew what was next. We thought the Capitol might be next and we'd be blown up with the Capitol. So I said to the producer, look, I'm not a military expert. I can't comment on this. You don't really need me, do you? And they said, no. So I got into my car, raced for my car, just barely beat the huge traffic jam out of DC, drove to my son's elementary school, pulled him out of school. That's you. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do actually. <laughs> pulled you out of school, drove to our farm out in rural Western Maryland. Our mom was away at the time because I didn't even want to be in Bethesda because you know we had no idea, which is right next to, of course, DC, we had no idea what might be happening next. So, it, it, you know, it was sheer terror simply because of, you know, this being so unprecedented and so little information being available. Ben Weinberg asked, will the 2024 election be as close as 2000? I don't think we'll ever have an election decided by 537 votes. So my answer is no. Miles Wolf asked, do you think Trent Tread. Ted Cruz can be beaten in Texas. It's kind of like Florida going blue, you know. For 20 years, people have been telling me Texas is going to go blue because when the Hispanic vote, you know, really grows to its potential, it'll turn Texas blue. Well, two things. One, the Hispanic vote has not grown to its potential. And two, in recent years, it's not been as solidly democratic as one might think. So, you know, to quote the great Jewish prime minister of England, Benjamin Disraeli, you know, we don't use the word finality in politics. So I'm not going to say with finality that Ted Cruz is going to get reelected, but for 20 years and every single election, uh, the predictions about, you know, Democrats being able to win statewide elections have been proven false. Not a single statewide election for anything, including Supreme Court, Court of Criminal Appeals, has been won by a Democrat in, in recent years. K.A. donated five bucks and said, minutes ago, Israel conducted a missile strike on Iran. But I, I'm, oh. well, I'm looking this up. I don't see any any major outlets reporting that, so... Maybe a rumor, huh? I don't know. Yeah, just a rumor for now. I don't know. Let me, let me look it up, too. What are people I saying in the chat? News for you. Has anybody found any confirmed sources of Nothing. this? Yeah, I, I, Nothing. Yeah, I didn't see anything either. Um, and I get flashes from Google News if there's any anything breaking. So that might be a rumor. But who knows? It might be like an early report and yeah, just not, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't, don't want to speculate. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban has openly supported Trump. If Biden wins, are U.S. sanctions against Hungary likely? I don't think so. Uh, I think, you know, Biden, again, I, I don't, I'm just speculating, take it for what it's worth. I think Biden would at least initially try soft diplomacy and try to build up maybe a, a, an opposition movement in Hungary as difficult as that is, rather than take punitive measures. Fire on Ice 233 says, Professor, why is our justice system failing us? Why did Michael Cohen go to jail for Trump's crimes? He didn't even sleep with the porn star. Why is Trump getting away with <laughs> violating gag orders? Well, we don't know that Trump slept with the porn star, although I certainly believe he did, but I, I can't prove it. Uh, it's certainly consistent with everything we know about Trump. So I do believe it, but, you know, but it doesn't matter whether he slept with her or not. That's not an issue here. It's not an issue that he paid her $130,000. And by the way, Trump doesn't even pay the people who paint the walls of his bedroom. He stiffs them. And you telling me, he would pay $130,000 to Stormy Daniels on a made-up, fabricated story. Zero, zero chance of that. So, But that's not what he's on trial for. He's on trial for falsifying 
the payments as though they were business expenses, committing tax fraud and election fraud. And yes, you're right. Michael Cohen did go to jail for the same thing. And the reason, again, I'm speculating, but you know, the reason probably the feds didn't prosecute Trump was this was during the Trump administration. He was a sitting president. And who was the attorney general, Sam? Um, Jeff Sessions. A little after that, Bill Barr. Who cares about Bill Barr? Well, Bill Barr, according to a lot of reports, quashed any attempt to prosecute uh, Donald Trump for the same thing. That's why it went to the states. But you've heard me say many times, I'm not happy with the American justice system. I am really unhappy with a lot of the prosecutional decisions. You know, I've said many times, Merrick Garland is my old friend. I've known him since the 60s. I thought he was one of the greatest of federal judges, but terrible prosecutor. Same thing with a host of other prosecutors. They've sat on their hands. Derek Taylor wants to know if your book is coming out in June or July and will it include July. Your, will it include your 2024 prediction? You'll have to wait and see. Ah, you have to wait and see, Derek. I don't give it I don't give it away. You have to read the book. Uh Bienvenida Garnett says, What advice would FDR give to Biden as a candidate running again for president? That's a tough question. So you have to be yeah. FDR giving advice to Biden. Yeah. Two things. One, FDR would say the most important thing is to govern well. You know, make sure the economy doesn't tank like it did under my predecessor, Herbert Hoover, which, you know, was a grievous blow to his ability to beat me in 1932. Then the other thing is prove your vigor. You know, disprove all this sleepy Joe nonsense campaign as vigorously as I did in 1944 when I was similarly being attacked. Not so much my age, I wasn't that old, I was in my early 60s, but for my health, and I made a vigorous campaign tour and disproved it all. How was that, Sam? Good. Everybody is saying Channeling that. FDR? Everybody is saying that Israel struck Iran. Like Really? There's like, you know, hundreds of people, not hundreds, but dozens of people in the chat right now saying it. Well, I gotta I, believe it. I still don't see anything. I don't see anything either, and Again, the devil's in the details. Was it a really serious attack or a symbolic attack? Or was it a, an attack at all? No, I don't see a thing on the news feeds. All right. Anyways, we'll, 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 do, AP. we'll do two more questions. Um, yeah, I didn't say anything on AP. I'm going to go live after this, folks. So if you want to come chat more, I will be live. I just posted my live channel in the chat. You got to give me a second after this stream to, you know, transition to the other stream. Yeah, give them a little time. And maybe you'll know more during Sam's chat about the supposed attack. Yeah. Um, 13 Keys. Two more questions. 13 Keys Apologists with their first super chat. Thank you, 13 Keys Apologists. They say, Professor, I have a question about the keys. I read your book or an excerpt that showed Grover Cleveland had eight keys true in 1888 but lost. Why did he lose? I don't remember. It today, no the memory. <laughs> no, I'd have to go back and 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 recheck that. Um, e B Chill Two says, "Great channel, thank you." I'm worried about Lukashenko passing away and what kind of crisis that would cause. Okay, I don't know. It's a good question. I, I I'm not enough of an, a European expert to say so i'll take a pass on that one all right i'll give one more question to a non-member if you're a non-member get your question in a non-donation get your question in right now and i'll ask it people are saying abc news cnn fox news are all reporting it uh, let me get on cnn maybe maybe my feeds are just a little late but usually it crops up immediately all right here's a good question from michael taylor um oh he's one of our buddies yeah how do you assess the potential impact of efforts by abortion rights groups to pass a ballot measure in november protecting abortion rights considering 
the state's pivotal role in the 24 election? Again, it doesn't turn a key, so it won't affect my prediction, but absolutely, you know, outside the context of the key, it's a very good thing for Democrats. And certainly, undoubtedly, it's going to have an effect on every down ballot election from Senate to House. I still don't see it on CNN. That's yeah, so weird. I, I don't see it either. From Senate to House to everything else. And by the way, what? You know, we talked about, you know, the MAGA movement uh, promoting violence. Kerry Lake, the, I guess, presumptive Republican nominee for Senate in Arizona, has just come out and say, you know, all my supporters, strap on your Glocks. You know, they don't come right out and say, you know, pull your guns and kill people. But, you know, just takes one crazy follower you know, to do this, like we saw at the Tree of Life synagogue or the El Paso massacre. It's just horrific the way, you know, violence is becoming normalized among the MAGA crowd. It's very, very frightening and very sad. No wonder jurors are worried. I would be too if I was on the jury. Right. All right. Dr. Ash, our good friend, is now saying it's on CNN's front page. I'm going to double check one more time before we sign off here. Let's see. CNN's okay. front page. I did not see it. I was just on CNN. Me too. My front page still says five takeaways from Trump's hush money trial. That's what mine says. All right. Yeah, well, really if you want All to right. keep chatting, you can come on my live stream and maybe. Yeah, talk to Sam about it because we're done here. Um, any final? If, if in fact this is a big deal, we might do a special tomorrow. On a Friday? I got a party. Oh, no. I never party, so I'm too old. You know? uh, we'll see. But any we'll see. final words for the for the folks out there, Dad? Yeah. You know, forget the polls, forget the pundits, forget the media downplaying this trial of Donald Trump. It's not just the first time a former president's on, in a criminal trial. It's the first time any major party candidate is subject to criminal prosecution. And regardless of whether he's accused of doing other things that are more serious, this trial is of immense seriousness. And keep your eye on the Congress. You know, your freedom, your freedom could well depend upon what the, whether the Congress does the right thing in aiding our allies abroad. And with that, we'll say good night on this channel. My dad will say good night. If you want to keep chatting, I'll be on my channel. Say good night, dad. Good night. Donate. Join.